Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School, and today we're going to be looking at how to fly a VFR route that we've created, and we'll look at how to use landmarks to find our way, as well as how to time each of our legs so that we have an idea where we're at. And we'll look at a ton more little details along the way that'll come in handy for your next VFR flight. We're also going to look at how this all fits in in the era of glass cockpits where you can have a GPS with a magenta line pointing you in the right direction at any time. So make sure that you stick around if that all sounds interesting to you. Back when I first started with flight sim all the way back in the mid 90s, the general aviation planes only had round gauges and there were no GPSs to be found. Uh, times have definitely changed since then though and these days a lot of trainer and beginner planes now come with completely glass cockpits and in fact in flight sim it's almost hard to find a round gauge airplane anymore. So with that in mind, for today's flight I'm going to be using the Kodiak, but I'm not going to load the flight plan into the GPS and instead we're going to look at how to use visual references and a nav log to find our way. This is definitely going to increase the challenge level a fair bit, but let's be honest, following a magenta line around gets pretty boring pretty quickly. I planned the route for this flight a few videos back and we're going to be going from Long Beach eastbound to just past Palm Springs. So if you want to know more about how to plan a route like this, you can check out that one for all the details. But we'll be using that plan today to get ourselves to our destination. We've got some light winds from the west today, so we're taking off from runway 26. And for our first leg, we're heading to the Los Alamitos airfield, which is also called Seal Beach. And on our map, it's to the southeast on a heading of 097. But as we're going to learn here in just a little bit, there is a little bit more subtlety to it than that. You're going to see me accelerate some parts of the video here just to make it more practical to show you how I'm doing stuff at different stages of the flight. Normally, I would just skip over some stuff and get straight to the waypoints. But for a VFR flight, I find this format's going to work a little bit better for us. Taking off from 26 like we just did means that we're pointing west, but our first waypoint is southeast of our departure point. So to get going in the right direction, I'm going to start a very wide turn to put us on a downwind leg for the runway that we just took off from, and that'll get us pointing in the right direction. That means that we're effectively parallel to the runway we just took off from, heading eastwards now, and we can turn our attention to finding our first waypoint, which I'm going to do entirely visually by just looking out of the windows for it. Now, I'm not flying the 097 track that the map says because we made that left 180 degree turn after takeoff, which means that we're to the south of where we'd have to be to fly that heading. So at this point, I need to start looking for our waypoint up ahead. It helps to have an easy landmark that you can spot visually for your first waypoint after takeoff. And what I try to do is line myself up so that I'm going to be offset from it by just a bit to make it a little bit easier to see it off the side of the airplane. When you're only traveling a short distance between waypoints, say 10 miles or less, and you have a fairly clear landmark to look for, like an airport or a mountain, you can definitely get away with just using your eyeballs to find your way, and it definitely keeps you a lot busier than following a magenta line around. Our first waypoint is coming up right now, actually. We can see it just off to the right there. So this was a really easy one to get us warmed up, but now we've got to do a little bit more work to set up the second leg. This next leg goes from the airport we're coming up on right now at Seal Beach and it takes us out towards Anaheim and we should fly right over Disneyland and then just beyond that we should have Anaheim Stadium visible as well. Finding waypoints like this in a large urban area can be pretty challenging because all of the buildings tend to sort of look the same and you never really know how well Flight Sim is going to generate them anyways. So what we're going to do to help us then is use a process called Dead Reckoning that's going to let us fly a given course for a predetermined amount of time to bring us right over our next waypoint. So if we have a look at our flight plan in Navigraph, it does have a course on it of 067 degrees from Seal Beach out to our next waypoint. But unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as flying that heading when you're actually in the airplane because you have to take into account the winds and the local magnetic variation. Normally, you would do all of these calculations to figure out what heading to fly and for how long by creating a nav log for your flight. And we're going to use Navigraph along with another tool to get her to generate it for us automatically. 
Navigraph have added a lot of features in the past year for VFR flying, but unfortunately a navlog isn't one of them, at least as of the time I'm recording this. So what I'll do to get around that is I'll go up to the text route bar that's right at the top. I'll copy my entire route and then I'll open a browser tab onto Sky Vector and I'll just paste my route into its window there. Once you press tab, it's automatically going to calculate all of your route out for you exactly like you had it in Navigraph. And then from there, I'm just going to change the airspeed field to be a little bit higher to reflect the higher cruise speed of the Kodiak that I'm going to be using today. And then all we got to do from there is press the nav log button to generate it for us. As you can see, there's a lot of numbers and calculations for each of the legs of our route, and we'll dig into that a little bit later on. But put simply, the two fields that we're going to be using are the magnetic heading, which is the MH field, and it tells us what direction to point, and the estimated time on route field, which is going to tell us how long it's going to take us to get to that waypoint, and that's in the ETE field. All right, so we're basically parallel to our first waypoint now, so we're going to need to change headings. And our next leg from Seal Beach to the Disneyland waypoint says that we need to fly on a heading of 065 degrees for just about two and a half minutes to get there. I'm using the autopilot to make things easier for myself, so I'm going to set the heading to 065 to match what we see in our nav log. And I'll also bring up the integrated timer so that we know approximately when we should be coming up on our waypoint. The other thing that we can do to help us figure out where we are and where we're going is to compare the rows that we're seeing in Flight Sim to those that are being shown on the flight plan in Navigraph. So for example, right now there's a highway that runs eastbound just to the south of where we are and where it reaches the junction, it looks like our waypoint at Disneyland should be just north of that. So that gives us a pretty good idea of where we should be looking in Flight Sim to try and find it because we can see that highway right now and that'll at least give us an idea where to look for it. Now, according to our navlog, it should take us about two and a half minutes to get to our waypoint at Disneyland. So as we're flying the airplane, we also want to keep an eye on the timer so we know when we're getting close. And we'll want to spend most of our time looking out the window to find what we're looking for. One thing you're probably wondering about is why we use the magnetic heading to fly from point to point, and we're going to cover that in just a little bit. But if you have any questions or comments after you've finished the video, feel free to pop them below. And while you're at it, please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe as well so you can get other similar videos. All right, we should be close to the waypoint according to our timer. We can see the stadium's just out there and it looks like Disneyland is just off to our right here and it isn't quite as easily spotable as we might have thought. So the lesson here is to just always be on your toes when you use a building as your waypoint because you never know how it's gonna be rendered in Flight Sim. All right, with that, we are on to our next waypoint which is that mountain up ahead, which is Pleasant's Peak. And if we look back at our nav log, it says that we should fly a heading of 082 to get there for about six minutes. So I'm going to aim myself that way, but I won't worry about timing this leg because we can obviously already see where we want to go and there's no risk of us getting lost. This is the main reason I like to use mountains as waypoints when I'm in urban and suburban areas because for the most part, they're really easily identifiable. Although if you're traveling in the mountainous area like say Colorado, then you're gonna have to rely on something else like the roads that go from city to city because all of the mountains start to look the same after a while. We've got a bit of time flying on this leg until we get to our next waypoint that's up ahead. So let's break down the nav log a bit more so that we have a rough idea of how it all works together. And we won't spend a ton of time on these calculations because I suspect most of you are just gonna wanna fly the route with the nav log rather than build it yourself. But if you pause the video on any of the graphics that I put up, I've put some arrows and explanations so you can understand the details a bit better. Before you can understand how the navlog works, the first thing you need to know is the difference between a magnetic heading and a true heading. The magnetic north pole is the direction that your compass points at all times. And true north, on the other hand, is the direction towards the geographic north pole, which is different from magnetic north. 
The difference between them is what's known as magnetic variation, and that's going to vary depending on where you are in the world, how much of a difference there is. And you can even see those values in Navigraph when you're doing your flight planning by just clicking on a waypoint and you'll see it in the properties on the left. Now we've got two instruments on this airplane that can tell us our heading. We've got our magnetic compass, which points to magnetic north, and we have our heading indicator, which in a G1000 like this one is going to be automatically synced to the magnetic heading. But in a steam gauge airplane, you would have to sync the heading indicator to the compass heading so that they match up. That means that both of our tools to figure out our heading are pointing at the magnetic north pole. However, when you're creating a nav log, either by hand or with an automated tool like we use today, it's going to use true headings to calculate it out. And then those get converted into magnetic headings so that we can fly them in the airplane because that's where our compasses point. So for each leg of our flight, the nav log takes the true heading between the two points, it adjusts it for wind, and then it converts it into a magnetic heading using the local magnetic variation so that we can fly it in the airplane with our heading indicator. The other field that's important to get right in the nav log so that we have an accurate estimate of the duration of each leg is the airspeed. And rather than using your indicated airspeed here, you have to use your true airspeed, which is adjusted for temperature and pressure altitude. As you can see, I used 150 knots for our nav log calculation, but we're actually traveling a bit faster than that right now at 185. So our nav log times are going to be longer than the actual time it takes us to fly a leg. So you could just leave it all as is and just be aware that the times are gonna be slightly off. Or the other thing you can do is go back to Sky Vector, change the airspeed to the new value, rebuild the nav log, and then just use those numbers instead. There are, of course, other ways that you can recalculate your time en route for a specific leg if you're flying it at a different speed, but I find it's all a little bit more complex than it needs to be for flight simming, and this approach is really good enough for me. One thing that's important to keep in mind, if you export the flight plan from a tool like Navigraph and then you load it into Flight Sim on the world map, it's going to create a nav log for you that you can bring up in Flight Sim. And although these are magnetic headings that it's showing, they're not adjusted for winds. So if you try and fly them, you might end up off course if the winds are strong enough, especially for longer legs. All right, with all of those explanations out of the way, it looks like we are now almost right over our waypoint at Pleasant's Peak and we're ready to tackle our next leg. So it's going to be time to change course again. And if we go back to our nav log, it looks like we need to turn to a heading of 058 this time. And we'll reset our timer as well, since we're going to use our recalculated estimated time en route for it, which is going to be about 2 minutes and 30 seconds to get there. Our waypoint's just up ahead, so we could just fly this leg visually again, but being able to check it with the timer to verify our position can be important in some cases. For example, the first time that I flew this flight, I didn't time my legs, and I ended up confusing the lake that we're going towards for another one that's actually much closer to the mountain that we just passed. And although I didn't get lost, it definitely confused me for a while. As we come up on the waypoint here, if we check our timer, it's now at 2 minutes 15 seconds. So that's pretty close to what we had calculated. And now we have to quickly reset to fly the next leg out to Palm Springs. In the next video, we're going to continue our flight and we're going to look at the very basics of using a nav aid to help us out when there are no useful landmarks that we can use. But until then, please make sure to hit the like button if you learned something useful and subscribe as well so that you don't miss out on the next one.